Hi, I'm Rich Burnett from The Sound of Machines, and in this video I'm going to show you how to build a Cassatone synthesizer. So what is it? It's a DIY synth that combines a modified cassette player with a custom-built case that allows you to control the pitch of the cassette with these keys. Each key slows down or speeds up the motor of the player depending on the position of each of these dials. It has an audio output in the back that allows you to feed the signal through your audio workstation or an amplifier. The sound that this thing makes relies on whatever is on this tape. For example, here's a few tapes that I've been messing around with. Now, I'd like to start off here with a bit of a disclaimer. This here is the first prototype. One thing I was struggling with was getting it to only play when the key is pressed. In order to control this main pitch that plays all the time and to keep it in the key of whatever song I was working on, I added this master pitch control on the side. But here's the thing, even though I'm certain I followed the same layout for the model you'll see me build in this tutorial, the note now cuts off when the key is not pressed. You can see that the motor on this new one comes to a halt. I didn't know that this would happen until after I finished this build. So, while you will see me prepare this dial in the tutorial, it's not connected to anything. It's not necessary anymore. But just in case your project performs like my original prototype does, I've left the wiring schematics for this master pitch control in the plans that are linked in the description below. All right, with that out of the way, let's get on to the build. The base wood planks that we'll use for this project can be found at your local craft store. These are 4 inches wide, which is the exact height that some of our pieces will be. And they're 3 16ths of an inch tall, which is important for the measurements on this layout to fit correctly. The first step is to print out the templates, cut them out, and then trace them to your wood. Then it's time to cut everything out. I find it's much easier to use a blade to cut this wood. It takes a few passes with the blade before you can snap the seam. I also cut the back side of each piece to keep the break smooth. For the faceplate where the dials go, I used a scrap piece of heavy duty cardboard from the back of an old sketch pad. Now to drill the holes for all the electronic components. It's a good practice to start by drilling small pilot holes as guides. It doesn't matter what order you do these, just keep in mind that the master control knob here is optional. So you might want to hold off on drilling that one until you know whether or not you need it. For the holes for the buttons that go under the keys, I used this 11 16th inch paddle blade. With these holes, don't drill straight through. Get about halfway and flip the piece over and do the rest. You can also drill the holes for the knobs just fine through the cardboard faceplate. For these, I used a quarter inch drill bit. The drill bit I used for the output jack on the back panel is 21 64ths. Now for the two holes that hold the support bar for the piano keys. This bit is 13 64ths inch. You may want to take some time sanding down the edges of your cuts just to remove any little lumps that will keep the edges from joining together smoothly. Make sure that the holes are also smoothed out so that your electronic parts fit okay. Here I'm using a file to sand them out. 
And now that you have all the pieces set to go, let's assemble them. Before starting, I take a half inch by half inch square dowel that I also bought from the craft store, and I cut seven small pieces to use for supports inside the case. I use hot glue on these so that they set fast, but I use wood glue on the edges of the case parts for a tight bond. You might notice that I haven't drilled a hole on top uh, where the wires from the cassette player go. I didn't think to add those until after the build. Now with the top glued on, I move to the bottom front face. And then I move on to the back. It's important to fit the pieces together as I have, where the top fits between the sides and the back fits between the sides and under the top. Otherwise your sides won't line up correctly. And I add these little support blocks as I go. Now I glue the border piece around the control panel. The front panel is glued in place. I also hot glue the seams inside the case for extra support. For this front rail insert piece, be sure to glue the tall side to the front so that the edge of the wood is visible on top. For the panel that goes under the keys, make sure that the holes are facing the front of the case. Use the marking on the template for a guide where to glue this piece into place. There's some room for error here, so it's okay if you aren't dead on. You'll want to make sure to put some little dowel supports under here as well. Now you'll need to prepare the key support rod. This is a simple threaded rod you can get from any hardware store. For this project, I use this number 8 32 size. You'll need to cut it to 6 and 3 quarter inches long. I used a Dremel to cut it to size, but you can also use a little hacksaw as well. Make sure to smooth the cut edge so that you can still fit a nut over it. This threaded bar will stick out a bit from the edges in order to be fastened into place. In order to attach the keys to the support rod, we need to cut some short tube pieces from this quarter inch PVC. This is also available at any hardware store. Unfortunately, this piece that I found is only available in five foot lengths. This tube can be sliced fairly easily with a blade. Cut a short length of this tube for each key. It's okay if they're not as wide as the key, but just as long as they aren't wider. Now, with the push buttons and support rod in place, lay your keys into the case. You'll want to make sure that they don't hit the front of the front rail or they won't push down easily. Once they're nicely lined up, tape them down so that they don't fall out and turn the case over. Use the support rod to draw a guideline. This will show us where to glue the tubes. And now with the keys back out, use hot glue to glue the tubes to each key. Just a note that the hot glue might not be the best glue to use for this, it's just what I had handy here. Now with all the parts glued together, see how the final case looks. When I saw how my keys were positioned in the case here, I decided to tweak their position a little bit. Luckily hot glue will release from the plastic tubing with just a little bit of force. So I won't really get into how to finish your case since that's more of a personal choice. I'm sure some of you will make designs that'll blow me away. When I do woodworking projects, I tend to make them look all beat up and aged, which is what I'm gonna do with this piece here, starting with a coat of varnish. Junkyard carpentry at its finest. Now onto the cassette player modification. For this project, I'm using this Byron Statix brand cassette player. It's the cheapest model you'll find on Amazon and it comes in a few different finishes. Obviously I chose teal. The cool thing about these is even for the price, they have features like an AM FM radio, an onboard speaker, and a record function. I also like that they're powered by USB. It's easier than needing a proprietary power adapter. They will run on two AA batteries, but I prefer to keep them at maximum power through the USB. In order to get the player to sit flat on the synth case, we need to first remove the clip, and then cut away at the remaining plastic slots until they're also flat. It's okay if they're messy, since you won't see this part anyway. Now unscrew the back cover. 
you'll need to bend this part of the case just a little bit to get it up and over the volume dial and then to gently pry the interlocked side apart. It's simple, but it's a little finicky the first time you try it. The circuit board on this thing is pretty complex and packed together. We'll only focus on two spots. This area here is where the speed control is located. And this spot here is where we'll connect the output. The first thing we'll do is to remove the speed control potentiometer that's attached to the board. There's only one screw holding this board in place. Remove it so we can access the component from underneath. If you want to continue using batteries for power, be careful with these spots here when you lift the board up. They broke off on my prototype. We don't need the board to come way off, just enough to reach this little trim pot. We're going to extract it like a little tooth. For this part, I use a solder sucker to help remove the component. Melt the three leads with your soldering iron and suck up the excess solder. The potentiometer might be free at this point. If not, gently push the exposed leads through the board with the tip of your soldering iron. When it's free, just remove it and secure the board back in place. Next, we'll prep the audio output. So a bit of a warning, I prefer not to have the cassette player's speaker on at all, so I remove it completely. If you choose to keep it on, it would require some simple steps not shown here. But if you're cool not having audio from the cassette player's speaker, here we go. These wires are not inserted through the board, they're simply soldered onto the surface. Remove these and cut away the excess. Here, I use a yellow and blue wire to replace the red and black ones. These will go to the audio output jack. One important thing that you should do frequently is to test your connections. Here, I temporarily connected an audio jack in order to be sure that I was getting a signal out before moving on. You may or may not choose to do this part since it's pretty permanent, but I like to keep some connections nice and secure to the board with hot glue. This protects the solder points from breaking during handling of the wires. Next, we'll connect wires to the speed control points. Here, I'm using black for the ground and red and white for the side terminals. The colors I choose are arbitrary, by the way, they don't represent the flow of electricity. Just as long as each of them are a different color, it's easy to know which is which when you're soldering them into the case. Now, with everything connected, feed the wires through the hole that's left from the belt clip and re-secure the back of the case. Remember that you'll probably need to futz a bit with the volume dial in order to get it back in place. And again, you probably want to make sure that you're still getting audio out. Now it's time to put everything into the case. Here's my beat up aesthetic. I also mod podged a bunch of old cutouts from popular science magazines from the 50s onto the case and the keys. It's classic vintage electronic stuff. I painted the inside yellow to make it easier to see the wiring for this tutorial. And yeah, the hole on the top will actually be cut to a larger size off camera once I realized that it's just not right. Now populate the case with all the components. I won't show this entire process as it's fairly straightforward. Just keep in mind that some holes might need additional sanding for the elements to fit. For the keys, add additional nuts on the inside of the case for added stability. These need to be the same gauge as the threaded rod, number 832 for this project. It might take a little bit of tweaking to get the rod centered. But when it's ready, go ahead and fasten the outside nuts to secure it in place. Now you'll notice a bit of wiggle in your keys. I found a few tweaks to help keep these in place. First, I placed just a tiny drop of hot glue on the top of each button and pressed the key down to keep it secured. Now the back of the keys do still wiggle around a bit. 
I solved for this a few ways, both of which I didn't think of trying until after I wired everything up. And that's why my synth will now momentarily skip into the future. First, I cut a thin length of craft felt, the length of the keyboard, and slide it into the space between the case and the keys. This will keep them from jostling upward. I secure the felt in place with hot glue from the inside of the case. Unfortunately, it's not easy to access this area with a glue gun. I just let it drip down in order to make sure that the felt stays stuck to the case and the keys. Once again, junkyard carpentry. And then I actually join each key to its neighbor with a little bit more hot glue. The keys still move independently just fine, and now their action feels a lot more stable. And now connect the player to the case. I use Velcro for this. For easiest access to the buttons and the power port, you want to position the player in the front right, as I've done here. Now, with the case flipped over, it's time to start wiring. And again, I won't go through this part step by step, since it's all in the wiring guide that I linked in the description below. I like to use this adhesive copper tape in my electronic projects. It keeps the layout less confusing and makes my solder points a lot easier to access. Solder sticks to it super easily, so I prep my connection points with a tiny drop of solder directly to the tape as I go. Hopefully, when you're done, your wiring will look a bit like this. But bonus points if you actually keep yours tidy. As a finishing touch, I cut a piece of scrap wood to the size of the base and I screwed it onto a few of those little dowel support pieces that I glued inside of the case. I got these rubber feet from the hardware store and they keep the synth nice and stable on a desk surface. So hopefully yours came out okay. If you make one of these, post it, post a video, post pictures on Instagram and tag me so I can see it. I'd love to see what other people do with theirs. And that does it for this video and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.